Tonight we have come to the book of Haggai, the second shortest book in the Old Testament. But don't let that fool you. Don't let that brevity fool you. Its brevity is really a fresh bolt of reality, I think. And in my opinion, this book is easily the most practical book of all the minor prophets as we try to seek application to our 21st century lives, and I'll circle back to that in just a moment. So let's do what we normally do with these little books. Let's talk a little bit about the circumstances uh, around which the writing was given or the prophecy was given. Uh, the most important thing maybe to differentiate between our last study the one we had uh, about Zephaniah and tonight's study has to do with chrono chronology. Uh, prophets like Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk prophesied shortly before the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, and that's normally measured uh, between 606 and 536 B.C. But then following the return under the leadership of Zerubbabel, that would have been 536 B.C., it was not long before two more prophets were sent to the people of Israel. These two prophets were Haggai, but we're studying tonight, and then Zechariah. And this places this, this book about 100 years earlier, later I guess you would say, than the other books that we've studied. So they came before, and then about 100 years have now expired. And this would have been right around 520 B.C., or as Haggai 1 and verse 1 notes, the very first year of the, uh, the, the second year, I should say, of King Darius, Haggai 1 and verse 1. Notice that the people came back in 536 B.C., but this prophecy is given 16 years later. I'll explain why that is the case in just a moment. Haggai's name likely meant festival or, festi or festive, but I want to suggest to you that he was probably not the life of the party. The reason I say that is because he was a preacher of rebuke. At that time, the foundation of the temple um, which had been laid shortly after the arrival of uh, Zerubbabel, the leadership of Zerubbabel, remember 536 B.C. You can read about this in Ezra chapters 3 and 4, but 16 years now have gone by. So we're going from 536 B.C. to 520 B.C. 16 years have gone by now, and it is time for God to raise up Haggai, and later, as we'll see, Zechariah, to say to the people... It is time to build the temple. So here's why I say, and I said just a moment ago, that Haggai is so practical for us today. I believe that this book is really about this thing, putting first things first. Here is something all of us should be able to relate to. It's said that E.M. Gray spent his life researching one trait of successful people. He wanted to figure out what is the one common denominator that all successful people share and he called this the common denominator of success his study revealed that successful people's common characteristic was not hard work it was not good luck it was not even astute human relations although he agreed these things are very important and most successful people will figure out these things he said in this study the one factor that seemed to transcend all others was the habit of putting first things first. He said all common people share this one common denominator. They learn how to put first things first. He observed the successful person has the habit of doing the things failures don't like to do. He says they don't like to do them either. The successful person doesn't necessarily like to do the hard things, the things that those who don't succeed aren't willing to do. He says they don't like to do it, just like the people that don't do it, but they do. They do this. He says their dislike is subordinate to the strength of their purpose. In other words, they did the hard things that other people were not willing to do, and that circles back to this idea the core message of Haggai is about doing that putting first things first so here's why I think this book's message is so contemporary 
It was written to people just like most of you that are here this evening who would argue we need to do first things first. We need to put first things first. You see, these people, although they weren't putting first things first, they would have said, theoretically, you ought to do that. You ought to put first things first. Yet they weren't doing that. They had allowed their lives to be littered with misplaced priorities. They were doing other good things, but they were not doing first things first. So Haggai is commissioned to help God's people get their priorities in line with their thinking. And, you know, that's what God wants us to do. If we really believe first things come first, then we should act that way. And that's what these people needed to hear as well. Remember, 16 years had passed since the people had returned from this Babylonian captivity. Their initial efforts to rebuild the temple had started, but then they had come to a stop. While all the other people's lives went about as normal, they were in the process in those 16 years of basically getting used to not having first things first. So normally, you know, when things get out of line, it happens slowly, and yet it could last for a very long time, and it had in this case. They had been swallowed up in life things, good things, things that aren't inherently wrong, but they just forgot to put first things first. So Haggai comes along and he says, here is my message. Put first things first. And so what I wanted to do this, this evening is take just a moment and look at mainly Haggai chapter 1. Because in, it's in Haggai chapter 1 that I think you find a, a really good, simple three-point outline that can apply today. That helps us, just like it helped them, to reshape their thinking and get first things first in their lives again. So here are the three things that Haggai told the people that they needed to do to get their priorities in line. Number one, he said, stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to yourself. In Haggai chapter 1 and verse 2, Haggai says, stop telling the lie that the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should not be built. Now just think about that for just a moment. The people were apparently going around saying, it's not time to rebuild the temple. And, and, you know, if you could have just been a, a, a fly on the wall, so to speak, and you'd have heard these spiritual people, these believing people say, it's, just, it's not time to do this, you would have probably wanted to speak up and say, well, when is it ever going to be time to do it? Why is it not time? I mean, you've been here 16 years, have you not? When is it ever going to get time to do this? But they were going around, and they must have been reaffirming to each other, it's not time. It's not time to do this. People who have trouble with priorities tell themselves lies to keep from facing the facts. That's what they were doing. They were just telling a lie. They were saying something that, that was not true. And that's what people do. They tell themselves lies to keep from facing the facts. If, for instance, if you know the church is not where it ought to be in your life. And let me just stop and say, I realize I'm talking to the Sunday night crowd, okay? So you, you, you have taken a step that perhaps others may not always take, and I appreciate that very much. But just because we come to church does not mean the kingdom is where it should be in our lives. That's one of the ways we show it, of course. But it's not, it doesn't mean that it's really taking precedence in our life because we live most of our lives away from this place, do we not? So if you know the church is, is not where it ought to be in your life, it is easy to make up lies to make yourself feel better about that, is it not? We all probably have done it in one way or another. We, we might say, if we know the church isn't where it needs to be in our life, we might say, well, you know, it's just not time for me to do that yet. That sounds real familiar, doesn't it? We might justify it by saying, well, you know, I'm real busy at work right now. I've got this special project I've been assigned. We might say, I've been working so hard, whew, I need to rest more. So therefore, I don't have time to make the church priority in my life. Maybe we say, you know, I, I need to spend more time with my family. And you probably do. But you shouldn't do that at, at the expense of the church. Or, or you might say, you know, I, I want to travel more. I, you know, I've got to this point in my life where I can do this and I want to travel more. And so the church has got to take a back seat to my, my travel, my leisure. Someone might say, 
Well, the reason the church isn't where it should be is those folks down there at that church are hypocrites. Ever heard that one? And you know what? Us folks down here at this church are hypocrites, aren't we? Sometimes. But that's never a good excuse for someone to use about why the church isn't important in their life. We, we can always come up with a reason or, or an excuse or it really, most of the time, it's a lie. All these things are just excuses. One person said an excuse is the skin of a reason stuff for the lie. And Ben Franklin once said, I never knew a man who was good at making excuses that was good at anything else. So what Haggai says to these people is, stop doing this. Stop telling yourself lies. Stop saying it's not time to rebuild the temple. You would probably imagine that I would say something about Matthew 6.33 in this lesson because Matthew 6.33 is that, that famous passage about putting first things first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And that's really what Haggai was saying in the Old Testament. That's what Jesus tells us, those of us who are going to follow him. And if you're going to do that, stop lying to yourself. Secondly, stop thinking so much about yourself. Stop thinking about yourself. If you go to verses 3 and 4 in Haggai chapter 1, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? So he asked them a question. And of course, we know the answer. It was time. It was time for them to build the temple. And it was past time for the temple to continue to lie in ruins when they were spending their time doing other things. A person who makes excuses tells themselves lies typically because they're self-centered. When we lie to ourselves, when we make excuses, it will often be because we're just fixated on ourselves too much. And I want to say something about this verse, verse number four. Scholars believe the wording here in verse four about paneled houses. Uh, again, it says, is it time for you to yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? The scholars who, who, who really have weighed in on this, they suggest that this was not about the people providing food, clothing, and shelter, the shelter part of the basic necessities of life. The, the idea of them spending time on their paneled houses would have been much beyond the actual necessity of putting a roof over their family's head. Remember, 16 years have gone by. They could have built a house in all that other time, but what this suggests is they were fixated on physical things. And the example here is they were fixated on getting their lives in better shape, and they were allowing the temple of God to lie in ruins. These 16 years had gone by, and... This is not about finishing their houses. This is about being fixated with themselves. They were thinking way too much about themselves. And so the point, as you, I hope, understand, is not that we can't have nice things. The point is not you can't have nice things. The point is how dare we have nice things at the expense of not being involved in the work of the Lord while the, the work of the Lord lies in ruins. And so he says something that we really ought to pay attention to, verse 5. He says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. You know, it is easier to think about ourselves more than we think about more important things. It's real easy to do that. It's easy to pursue selfish desires and ignore God's desires. It seems to me that to not strive to put first things first and to give no thought to priorities is our carnal default setting. Think about that. That's just kind of who we are if we're not trying. So if we're not being intentional, if we're not considering our ways, we're probably not living a prioritized life. And if we aren't trying to live a prioritized life, then we go back to our default setting, and that is we just let things slide. And we might not be bad people. We probably aren't bad people. We're just not putting first things first. And so the only way to overcome this is to put first things first purposely, purposefully, and to stop thinking so much about ourselves. And if that sounds familiar, you probably read this in the book of Philemon one time, or the book of Philippians, I should say, one time. 
Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look, look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And maybe your translation in that last verse says, you must have this same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Putting first things first is being like the Lord. It, it's, it's prioritizing. And one of the big steps we need to take in getting there is stop thinking so much about ourselves. And then here's the third thing. The third thing is stop being burdened and be blessed. Now, that probably sounds like something I said this morning, and it's really similar. And I, I thought, you know, how, how ironic that here Haggai is talking about something we talked about this morning. Stop being burdened and be blessed. If you just build off of verse number 5 and go to verse 6, notice what he says after he says, consider your ways. He says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Haggai says, you're planting gardens, but you're not reaping the harvest. Somehow or another, you find food to eat, but you're not filled. Or you find something to drink, but you're still thirsty. You, you put on clothes, but they don't keep you warm. And you work, but your word, wages just seem to disappear. And I love the way this is expressed. He who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Probably every preacher has preached a sermon from that statement at some point or another. A bag with holes. What Haggai is describing here, I think, is they were living a burdened life. They were doing all of this. They were burdening themselves with going through the process of living life. It, what, what's wrong with these things he mentions? What's wrong with planting a garden? What's wrong with having something to eat? What's wrong with needing something to drink? What's wrong with going to the trouble of getting clothes for you and your family? Everybody needs to work and provide for their own. These are all good things. What he's saying here in verse 5 or verse 6 is, he says, these are the things of life. This is what life is all about. You need something to eat. You need something to drink. You need clothes. You need a job. Food, clothing, shelter is how we normally describe that. And, and yet what he's really saying is you are doing all of these things and you are burdening your life with these things. It's taking all the joy and the satisfaction out of life. And, and I, I imagine a lot of people in our culture feel this way. They feel like that life is such a burden, and they, the harder they try, the more of a burden it becomes. And what's his point? His point is, you can work yourself to death to try to be blessed and to, be, and to have satisfaction and enjoyment in life, but you're never going to get there if you forget the most important thing. And what's the most important thing? putting God in your life, putting first things first. When people put God first in their life, they plant a garden, and they have food and drink and a job. They go about doing the very same things that the people of the world do, but yet, for some reason, those people say life is a blessing. I'm blessed to be a Christian. I'm blessed to have the things that God's given to me and people that don't put God first do those things, and they say, life's a burden. The difference is they're not putting God first in their life. And I mentioned in Matthew 6, 33 earlier, remember the context there. The context is people go about worrying about things, providing things. These, again, are the, the necessities that people worry about, and it's the context of Matthew 6, 33, that the message is put first things first seek first the kingdom of god and these things these things that are already mentioned there that people worry about these things will be given unto you if you want life to feel like a blessing rather than a burden put first things first 
So twice in this passage, as we start to wrap this up, twice in this passage you note in verse 5 and verse 7, the people are told, consider your ways. If you're ever going to start changing your life, if your life is not prioritized, you've got to consider your ways. Haggai was asking for them to take the time to give careful thought to what they were doing. He wanted them to examine their lives. Examine yourselves, the New Testament says. Socrates wrote, the unexamined life is not worth living. Why keep living this life, this, this frustrating life of being burdened without considering your ways? And so each day we fail to prioritize, it's like a pilot. He refuses to adjust his course, and by the end of his journey, he's nowhere near where he needs to be. You don't want to live your life that way, do you? You don't want to live your life without considering your ways and adjusting your course because you, you have a destination, I hope, and I don't think you'd be here tonight unless you did, and you want that destination to be where God wants you to be with Him forever. And so how can you know that you're aligning your priorities the right way? Well, look at verse 8, and we don't, have, we don't want to take the time to read the rest of this book, but there are a few things that you can make a mental note about. How do you know if you're aligning your priorities the right way? In verse 8, because they had not done this, because they had not built the temple, the first thing he says is, go up to the mountains, bring the wood, and build the temple. I mean, that's not very uh, sophisticated. That's not very difficult to understand. They hadn't built the temple, and so God says, here's how you'll know you're doing the right thing. Go, bring, and build. God never makes it that hard. To please Him, to follow Him, to obey Him is usually pretty straightforward. We just have a problem of making that a priority in our life. So what we'll do is we'll be doing what God wills. That's the first way to know that you're setting your priorities right. You will be doing what God wills. He says to these people, this is what I want you to do. Go, bring, build. Secondly, what you will do if you're aligning your priorities right, is you will do things that glorify God. You will do things that glorify God. He says at the end of verse number 8, do this that I might take pleasure in it and be glorified. Think about that. How do you make God happy? You do what He wants you to do. He'll take pleasure in your life. And what you do will glorify Him. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who's in heaven. And then the third thing, if you want to know if you're aligning your priorities right, look around and see if God is blessing you. Now, don't mistake the fact that sometimes people look like they're being blessed when they aren't living right. So you've got to use a little common sense here, but look around and see if God is blessing you. The, the context here in Haggai 1 is these people are killing themselves and they don't have any blessings. As a matter of fact, if you read the rest of this book, two short chapters, one thing you'll see is, is God is withholding from them. He's withholding what He wants them to have because He knows they don't get it. And He says, get this, get this straight, fix it, and I'm just going to bless you. And so one of the ways you can know you are following the Lord is you'll start seeing the Lord's blessings. And over in the latter part of chapter 1, about chapter uh, 1 verse 12 and verse 13 he he says i am going to be with you i am with you you'll notice the lord's presence in your life and if you want the lord's presence in your life simply start living for him following him doing what he says and you will feel the lord's presence and you in addition will see his blessings in your life first things first you probably have heard the story, and so I don't even have to tell it. Put the big rock in first. You know the story. Put the big rock in the jar first. Get God first in your life. And all the other things that need to be done in life, you'll find room for them. You'll put them in second and third and fourth, but get first things first. And that's the contemporary message of Haggai the prophet. Those people believed in God. They believed in putting first things first. But for 16 years, they had told themselves lies. And they said, is, is it really time to do this? 
and Haggai's message is, you know better. You know better. Get this fixed so I can bless you. And I think that's what Lord, the Lord wants us to hear tonight. I want to bless you if you will put first things first. I hope you're doing that. If you're not a Christian, obviously you've missed out on the biggest thing of all. Put first things first tonight. Give your life to the Lord, your Savior, and you will see a remarkable change in your life. Utopia? No, not yet at least. You still will have problems. There still will be difficulties, but you'll see a remarkable change in your life if you put the Lord first and obey Him and become a Christian. And then the ability to follow Him. It's, it's, it's not our ability, it's His ability because He allows it. And that will cause you to want to put first things first like these people needed to do like we know we need to do and if we can assist you with that tonight we want to be able to do that we're going to stand and sing this song come if you will